Hi, this is Jackie Aronsa, and I'm very pleased today to be bringing you this presentation on the first on provisional tax and focusing specifically on the first provisional tax payment for the current year, which is running through to the end of February 18. So we refer to it as the 2017-18 year of assessment. Okay, so we're going to try and keep things simple, and so I'm trying to. Uh, focus this uh, in a way that is understandable, so without getting bogged down in too much uh, legislation, but also to keep it accurate, um, bearing in mind that this is not intended to be uh, comprehensive tax advice. It's giving you a, an insight into how provisional tax works um, to give you some understanding on that. And if you want more information, we really do recommend that you consult with an expert and uh, you can always send through emails. I'll give you the email address at the end of the presentation. Great, okay, let's get going. So what I'm going to be covering today is essentially these main things. What is provisional tax? And then how do I work out? Am I a provisional taxpayer? If I am a prov provisional taxpayer, what's required of me? How do I calculate my provisional tax liability? When do I have to pay provisional tax? And of course, what worries us all, what happens if I get it wrong? So we'll look at what are the sanctions, penalties, interest, etc. Okay, so let's start off. What is provisional tax? I mean, is this now new tax? Is this in addition to other kinds of taxes? Well, provisional tax is actually just part of our income tax system. And it's a way of making interim payments of provisional tax. So if a person's earning a salary, they would have their tax paid on a month-by-month -month basis through the PAYE or employee's tax system. If you're not earning a salary and you're earning your own income, perhaps you're running your own business, um, then SARS doesn't want to wait until the end of the tax year when people submit their tax returns and then wait until they get assessed. And so provisional tax is a way for SARS to recover tax payments every six months. So we talk about six monthly interim payments of income tax that are made through the provisional tax system. Now, of course, as with everything with tax, there are very specific rules, um, and the rules relating to provisional tax are set out in the fourth schedule to the Income Tax Act. So if you do want to get to the, 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 the root of the matter, as it were, and you want to go and pick up the legislation, find the fourth schedule to the Income Tax Act, that's where all the rules are sitting. Uh, SARS does make a lot of information available through their website. They have quite a useful guide on provisional tax as well. But always just be careful that whatever legislation or guide you are using, that it, it is up to date and current, because remember that the tax law changes on an annual basis. So you do want to make sure that you're using current rules. So that's why I stressed at the beginning that the rules that I'm referring to relate to provisional tax rules for this current year, the 2017-28 tax year. Right, now, how do I decide if I am a provisional taxpayer? Well, in the fourth schedule, there's a definition of a provisional taxpayer. And if you fall into the definition, then you're a provisional taxpayer. And if you don't fall into the definition, then you're not a provisional taxpayer. Except there's one rule that says if SARS says you're a provisional taxpayer, then you are a provisional taxpayer. So, yeah, we need to just bear that one in mind. But what does the definition actually say? So, you're a provisional taxpayer if you're a company. So all companies are by definition provisional taxpayers. Okay. If you're not a company, you're an unincorporated person. This is the next uh, bullet point that I'm looking at here on the slide. So unincorporated person, that's a person that's not in, in the, an incorporated form, right? So you're not a company. If you derive income other than remuneration or a salary, we could call that a salary. So if you get any income other than a salary, so for example, if you're getting rental income or you're getting taxable interest, okay, interest over and above the tax exemption that applies. So an unincorporated person who gets income other than a salary would be a provisional taxpayer, but I've got a little asterisk there because there is a, a condition that applies, which I'll come to just now. An individual who gets income from carrying on a business then you are a provisional taxpayer. So if you're carrying on business as a sole trader and you are getting income from that business, um, income, you know, as soon as you invoice a customer and you've got money owing to you, you've got income. Right, so an individual who gets any income from carrying on a business, uh, that person is a provisional taxpayer. And then an individual earning remuneration 
from an employer who's not registered with SARS. This is a new one that they've added in from this year. Um, so if you are earning remuneration, you're working for somebody as their employee, but they're not registered with SARS, so they're not withholding PAYE. Now look, they should be registered with SARS, but this is just a, a sort of a safety net here, that if, if your employer is not registered with SARS, then the onus falls on you, the person earning the income, that you are now the provisional taxpayer. You must make sure that you pay your tax on a six-monthly basis through the provisional tax system. So if no PAYE has been withheld because the employer is not registered with SARS, then you're a provisional taxpayer and you must then do all the necessary things that I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Now I've crossed out the word registered there because a lot of people still link to am I registered as a provisional taxpayer? And as of a few years ago, we no longer talk about a registered provisional taxpayer. You don't specifically register with SARS as a provisional taxpayer or deregister when you're no longer a provisional taxpayer. On an annual basis, you have to think about and work out for yourself, am I a provisional taxpayer as defined or not? And if you're a provisional taxpayer as defined, then you've got to comply with what's required of a provisional taxpayer. If you're not a provisional taxpayer for that year, because you don't fall into any of these criteria that I've listed, then you're not a provisional taxpayer and you don't have to worry about submitting uh, estimates to SARS and so on. Okay, so that's why I've crossed out the word registered. Don't, don't be focused on whether I'm registered as a provisional taxpayer or not. Just focus about on the circumstances whether I would come into this definition of a provisional taxpayer or not. But now let's get back to individuals. I was saying a person who earns income other than remuneration. Okay. But even if you're a person earning income other than remuneration, um, if you're not carrying on a business, then there's certain thresholds that apply. Remember, if you are carrying on a business, any income makes you a provisional taxpayer. But if you're an individual and you get no income from carrying on a business and your taxable income does not exceed the tax threshold, okay? So that's, in fact, I see here I've got last year's thresholds, but it gives you more or less uh, thresholds we're looking at, sort of 75,000 if you're under 65, 116, 150 for 65 to 75 year olds, 129,850 if you're over 75. So that's the tax threshold, the point at which you start paying tax. Okay, so if your taxable income is below the tax threshold, um, even if you've got income other than remuneration, as long as you're not carrying on business, okay, but if you've got um, investment income, etc., which is taxable, um, but your taxable income does not exceed the tax threshold, then you're not a provisional taxpayer. And if you're a person who has got no income from carrying on a business, all right, so you might have remuneration or salary, and you might have other income in the form of your investment income, but you're not actually carrying on a business. As long as your other income, your in, in investment income, the interest, foreign dividends, um, fixed property rentals, and salary from an unregistered employer. Okay, so those are things that possibly could make you a provisional taxpayer. But if the total taxable income from all of those sources does not exceed 30,000 Rand for the year, then you're not a provisional taxpayer. Okay, so I know this does get a little bit complicated. Um, but the key rules are, if you're just earning a salary and you've got PAYE withheld every month, you've got no other taxable income, then you wouldn't be a provisional taxpayer. Even if you're a director of a company or a member of a closed corporation, you're still paying your tax through the employee's tax system, and all of your taxes settled through the employee's tax system, essentially, then you're not a provisional taxpayer. So a provisional taxpayer is a person who's going to have a normal tax liability, um, partly or wholly, that is not paid through employee's tax. Okay, so that's like if you're carrying, your own, or carrying on your own business or you're earning other investment income that might cause you to have a tax liability. You're not paying employee's tax to settle that tax liability, so you would be looking at provisional tax. Now, some people may pay both employee's tax and provisional tax. That might be if you're earning a salary and maybe you've got a business going on on the side, maybe you're renting out property or something of that nature. So you've got other income that you're earning. So you'd pay employees tax, but you would also be a provisional taxpayer. Okay, I've just put there PBOs and that's public benefit organizations and tax exempt entities. They are not provisional taxpayers because they don't really have taxable income at the end of the day. Right, so 
how to decide if you're a provisional taxpayer. So if you're not a provisional taxpayer because you're just earning a salary and you're paying all of your um, tax through the employee's tax system, then you don't need to worry about the rest of this presentation. But if you are a provisional taxpayer, then stay with us. We're going to talk about what you have to do as a provisional taxpayer. Just as an example, following on what I was saying just now, if the person is earning a salary from a registered employer, right? So you are paying employees tax and this person has salary of 84,000 Rand. Let's say they also have um, interest income from South African banks and so on, and it's potentially all taxable. I'm not talking about tax-free investments here. So we've got interest income of 36,000 Rand. This person's got quite a lot of money, obviously sitting maybe on a money market or a fixed deposit account, earning interest income. Um, everybody, if you're under 65, you're, you get your first 23,800 Rand of interest is exempt. So we take off that exemption. His taxable income from interest is 12,200 Rand. Okay, so now is this person a provisional taxpayer? Well, they've got income other than remuneration because there's their remuneration, 84,000, and they've got income other than remuneration. But this income other than remuneration, this investment income is not more than 30,000 Rand. And this person is not actually carrying on a business, all right? Yes, they're earning salary and that's a form of a trade, but carrying on business is where you're actually working at carrying on your own business, right? Taking your own risks, etc. So this person is not carrying on a business and their salary income is subject to employee's tax. The employer is registered and their other income is less than 30,000 Rand. So this person will not be a provisional taxpayer. Okay, so if you saw with us and you realize, okay, that's maybe my situation, I'm not a provisional taxpayer, then you don't have to worry about anything else. But if this person, let's say everything was the same, that this person's interest income was, um, let's say 100,000 Rand, okay, and you took off the exemption of 23,800, that would leave 76,200 as the taxable income from interest. That is more than 30,000. So yeah, this person is a, would be a provisional taxpayer. And yeah, that's you. Then stay with us and we'll explain what you have to do. Right, so how do I actually calculate my provisional tax payment? The first thing is to estimate your taxable income for the year. Now, really important to bear in mind that what SARS wants to know is what do you think your taxable income is going to be for the whole year? When you're doing your first provisional estimate, we are only working with limited information, right? Because we don't know exactly what's going to happen between now and the end of February next year. But we can't just uh, say naught um, if, for example, this is our first year as a provisional taxpayer. We can't just assume our taxable income is naught. We have to make a considered um, estimate. So we'll have a look at how we work out that estimate just now. But it's really important that you get your estimate right, because when I talk about what happens when you get it wrong, 
there are certain steps that SARS will take if you don't get the right estimate. Okay, so the estimate is fundamentally important because that is going to drive the actual tax liability calculation and the tax liability calculation is going to drive what you actually have to pay to SARS. Okay, so it all starts with your estimate of taxable income for the year. Then you will calculate your provisional tax liability using the normal tax tables and deducting rebates and any other income taxes already paid through the employee's tax system. Okay, so how do I estimate my taxable income? Well, the question is, what do you, what do you actually think your taxable income is going to be for the year? And what we know so far is what's happened for the first six months of the year, right? I mean, if, if we are doing this estimate at the end of August, we we are six months into the year. We know what's happened so far. And so we know these business results and what other taxable income we might have had. And then we need to think about what do we expect our taxable income to be for the rest of the year. So you come up with an estimate of what your taxable income is going to be for the whole year, right? Try and get it as accurate as possible. There is a rule, this is a, a fundamental and fairly complicated rule, but it's critical to remember this, that whatever you estimate your taxable income to be um, at this time of the first period, which is six months into the year, you're estimating your taxable income for the whole year, right? Your estimate of taxable income may not be less than what we call the basic amount. And uh, that is a technical term, which I'll explain on the, on the next slide. So you estimate your taxable income for the year, but the law tells us that it can't, your estimate can't be less than the basic amount unless the law says the circumstances of the case justify the submission of an estimate of a lower amount. So let's just put some numbers here. If you expect your taxable income for the year to be 500,000 Rand, okay, but last year you were assessed, and, and when I say last year, the most recent um, tax year that has already finished was the year that ended February 2017. Let's assume that you've already been assessed for February 2017, okay? And you've got an SDO, you've got an assessed taxable income of, let's say, 700,000 Rand. But now you're expecting your taxable income for this year to be 500,000. But the rule says that your estimate can't be less than your last assessed taxable income of 700,000 unless the circumstances justify the submission of a lower amount. So you would have to have a really good reason and the circumstances would have to justify you coming in with a lower estimate. Otherwise, even though you think your taxable income might only be 500,000, you would actually have to use that basic amount of 700,000 because you can be sure that SARS will probably challenge uh, and ask you about your estimate. And if you can't justify why you're coming in with a lower amount, then they're going to replace your estimate with the basic amount of 700,000. Okay, so that's the sort of benchmark. So you want to estimate your taxable income for the year, but it can't be less than your last assessed taxable income of this basic amount. It's slightly more technical than that, but let's call it the last assessed taxable income for now. It can't be less than that, but it might be more than that. Okay, now notice that the estimate must be submitted even if your provisional tax payment is nil. So if you are a provisional taxpayer, you have to submit an estimate of taxable income to SARS even if you don't actually have to make a provisional tax payment. So it might be that you estimate your taxable income and maybe your estimated taxable income is, uh, let's call it 500,000 Rand, but you have actually paid employees tax, sufficient employees tax, that there'd be no additional top up tax, no additional provisional tax that would have to be paid. So your provisional tax payment is nil, but you must still submit the estimate because that's what's required of a provisional taxpayer. Okay, so let's come to this rather technical thing called the basic amount. What is the basic amount? Remember we said that when you're estimating your taxable income for the first provisional payment, which is the one that we're dealing, now, dealing with now at the end of August, we said that your estimated taxable income cannot be less than this thing called the basic amount unless you've got very specific circumstances that justify using a lower estimate. Now, when we talk about basic amount, basic amount means your last assessed taxable income. So it's the taxable income on your most recent assessment. But of course, that recent assessment, let's say it was for the 2017 year of assessment, okay? 
you might have had taxable capital gains in that 2017 year of assessment. Those happened in the 2017 year. They're not going to happen again in this 2018 year because you already sold those assets, right? So if you had any taxable capital gains in that assessed taxable income for 2017, you would just you would leave those out. So you take your taxable income minus any taxable capital gains that were included and certain lump sums. This would be severance benefits, retirement lump sums, uh, withdrawal lump sums from pension funds and so on. So those are taxed according to special tables and you don't have to pay provisional tax on that because those lump sums get taxed at source. So if there were any lump sums included in your taxable income, those special lump sums that are taxed according to the special tables, then you would take that, those out. Okay. Now you use the latest tax, uh, latest assessment as long as it was issued not less than 14 days before the date on which your estimate is due to be submitted. So if you're submitting your estimate um, at the end of August, that's the due date, count 14 days back. As long as you've got an assessment which was issued earlier than the 17th of August, then that would be okay. All right. Um, now, some people would have been assessed for 2017 by the 17th of August, in which case you could use your, your um, 2017 assessment. If you haven't yet submitted your, seven, your 2017 tax return, um, then it's very unlikely that you're going to be assessed by the 17th of August, in which case you would go back to your previous assessment, 2016. Okay. Now, remember that we're looking at the taxable income as per your most recent assessment. But if your tax affairs have got a little bit out of date and your latest assessment is quite old, it's kind of a few years back, then there might be this inflationary adjustment of 8% uh, per annum that we make to that last assessed taxable income. All right, so let's have a look and see when does this 8% adjustment apply. So usually we just use your taxable income as per your most recent assessment. But if it's a very old assessment, then we might have this 8% adjustment. So this 8% adjustment applies if your estimate is due more than 18 months after the most recent year assessed. So your estimate that we're talking about now, the first provisional return, which is due at the end of August 2017, right? If we count back 18 months, that takes us to February 2016. Okay, now if your last assessment is older than that, if it goes back to 2015, 2014, 2013, or anything before that, then your estimate, your current estimate, would be due more than 18 months after the end of that year. Let's say your last year assessed was 2015. That year ended end of February 2015. So this estimate of taxable income that you're doing at the end of August 2017 is two and a half years after the end of the 2015 tax year. So that's more than 18 months after the most recent year assessed. So then we'd have to apply this inflation factor. And when you have to apply this inflation factor, it does become quite tough because we talk about an inflation of 8% per year. This is the rate that SARS uses. <clears throat> the fact that current inflation is, is not sitting at 8% has nothing to do with it. This is a, a nominal amount that SARS uses this 8% adjustment. And when they talk about 8% for each year, you calculate the number of years from the end of your latest year that has been assessed through to the end of the current year in respect of which you are making an estimate. So we're doing an estimate at the end of August 2017. That relates to the 2018 year of assessment, the year that ends at the end of February 2018. So now you go to what is your latest year assessed? If it was 2015, and we count again how many years from the end of February 2015 to the end of 20 February uh, end of February 2018, that is three years. Well, so now you're going to have to do 8% times three, 8% for each of those three years. So it's 24% adjustment. So whatever your taxable income was in the 2015 year, you're going to have to add on 24%. I'll show you a couple of examples on this just now. <coughs> Let's have a look at this one. So in this example, which I've adapted from SARS Guide to Provisional Tax, also to highlight to you that SARS does have some quite useful information available in their guides. In this particular example, let's say that you are having to do an estimate for the 2017-18 year, 
And it's your first estimate, which you're going to submit on the RP6, right? That's your provisional tax form. And that's due on the 31st of August 2017. We talk about that as a 2018-01 tax period. Okay. So your 2018-01 RP6 is due at the end of August 2017. So we look back. What are our last assessments? Well, the 2017 tax year hasn't been assessed yet. You haven't yet uh, submitted your tax return. SARS hasn't issued an assessment yet for the 2017 tax year. But if you look before that, the 2016 tax year, that assessment was issued on the 15th of October 2016. Okay, so that's uh, quite a few months ago, 15th of October last year. And if we look prior to that, the previous assessment for the 2015 tax year was issued on the 1st of February 2016. Okay, so now we get back to the present. We have to come up with an estimate um, and want to know what our basic amount is for this estimate that is due on the 31st of August 2017. So what's our last assessed uh, taxable income would be for the 2016 tax year. Let's have a look at this over here. So that was issued, that assessment for the 2016 year was issued on the 15th of October 2016. That's more than 14 days before your estimate is due on the 31st of August 2017. So yes, we can use that assessment. Okay. If that assessment was only issued on, let's say, the 24th of August 2017, then we can't use it because it wasn't issued more than 14 days before the deadline date. But in this case, it was issued more than 14 days, so we can use the 2016 assessment. Right. So we have a look. What is our taxable income as per that 2016 assessment, um, excluding your capital gains and your special lump sums? But do we have to inflate that by 8%? Well, what is the time period from the end of the 2016 tax year to the due date of the 2018-01 provisional tax estimate, which is the end of August 2017? So we say from the end of February 2016 to the end of August 2017, that's 18 months. It, it is exactly 18 months. The law says that if it is more than 18 months, then we must apply the 8% uh, adjustment per year. But in this case, it's not more than 18 months. It's exactly 18 months. So we don't have to do the 8% adjustment. So when we say what is our basic amount, we can say it will be the last assessed taxable income as per the 2016 assessment. Obviously, you exclude any taxable capital gains that were included in that taxable income and any special lump sums. Okay, but there's no 8% adjustment. But of course, you can see here that if your uh, 2016 tax year had not been assessed yet, uh, at the time that you're doing your estimate for the first provisional for 2017, then you're going to have a little bit of a problem. Let's have a look at this example over here. If 2016 and 2017 tax years have not yet been assessed. So now let's assume that the latest assessment that you have was for the 2015 tax year. And let's assume that was issued on the 15th of January 2016. So that's more than 14 days before the end of August. So that's great. We can use the 2015 year. But now we have to say, what is the period of time that has elapsed from the end of the 2015 tax year until your estimate is due? So from the end of February 2015 to the end of August 2017, that's two and a half years, 30 months. That's more than 18 months, okay? And so that is going to trigger the 8% adjustment. But we can't just say 8%. We have to say 8% per year, counted from the end of February 2015. That's our last year assessed, February 2015, through to the end of February 2018, the end of the current year that we are in right now, the one for which we are busy doing an estimate. So from 2015 to 2018, is three years. So in this case, because I'm a bit behind with my tax affairs and I'm a bit slow in getting my tax assessed, I would take my taxable income for the 2015 year as per the assessment, minus capital gains, minus special lump sums, and whatever I'm left with, I have to add on 24%. So if my taxable income as per the assessment was um, a million rand, my basic amount is not a million rand, it's a million rand plus 24%, so it's 1.24 million is my basic amount. 
And remember the relevance of that basic amount. When I come up with my estimate of taxable income for the first provisional return, which is due at the end of August, my estimate cannot be less than that basic amount. Now, you know, you might have had taxable income of a million rand in 2015, and you've managed to kind of basically just hold things together, and, uh, you know, you're managing to increase your profits by maybe 5% a year if you're lucky. So maybe if you really had to estimate your taxable income for this year, you think, right, it might be, let's say, 1.1 million, okay? But now my basic amount is 1.24 million, based on what I was saying over here, because you had to add on this 24%. So now my estimate of 1.1 million cannot be less than the basic amount of 1.24 million, unless the circumstances justify that a lower estimate is reasonable. Now, how are you going to convince SARS that your estimate is justified? It's going to become quite difficult. SARS is going to put in their estimate in all likelihood of 1.24 million as being the basic amount. You think actually in all reality your taxable income would be lucky if you make 1.1 million. You're going to have to get ready to defend your estimate to SARS when they query your estimate. Um, yeah, you're going to have to be ready and have management accounts and some jolly good record keeping so that you can demonstrate that your estimate actually is less than that basic amount. So this basic amount is, um, yeah, it's like a, a line in the sand. And if you go below that line, you've got to be ready to defend it and defend your estimate. And if you can't defend it, then SARS is going to put in their own estimate and they're going to require you to pay provisional tax according to their estimate. Right, so having worked out your estimate of taxable income, and as, I, as you can see, that's quite a complex process in itself. It is certainly helped if you have good management accounts, if you're running a business, and good record keeping is critical. If you're an investor, a share dealer, or, you, or you're just building up a portfolio and you've got lots of interest that's coming through, maybe some foreign dividends that are taxable and so on, you really need to have good record keeping to work out your estimated taxable income and be able to demonstrate to SARS why your estimate is, is, is acceptable. So once you've worked out your estimated taxable income, the next step is calculating your tax liability. That part is, is pretty straightforward because you just work with the tax tables, you use the rebates, that's all given to you in the legislation. And you would then take off any taxes that you've already paid for the year through the employment tax system. So this is a bit of a, a, a sort of a step-by-step. -step. You would calculate, this is now for the 2018 first provisional payment, all right, because this presentation is just focusing on the first provisional payment. So you estimate your taxable income for the year, as we discussed, bearing in mind the rule around the basic amount, okay. Then you calculate, using the normal tax tables, what is your normal tax payable, then you deduct whatever rebates you're entitled to, your primary. If you're under 65, you get your primary rebate. If you're between 65 and 75, you get your secondary rebate. And if you're over 75, you get the tertiary. You get all three. Okay. But if you're under 65, you just get the one, the primary rebate. And then you can deduct any tax credits. So that's the monthly tax credit that you get for your contributions to medical schemes, the Section 6A tax credit. And then if you have any additional medical expenses tax credit under 6B, you can deduct that. But um, that's, that, you know, for the average person, it's unlikely you're going to get that additional credit. But, you know, it's possible that you might have something there. Then you come to your normal tax payable. Right. So this is all based on an annual amount, the annual taxable income, the annual tables, annual rebates, annual credits, etc. Come to the normal tax payable, then you divide that by two. And then you deduct whatever tax you've actually paid for the first six months. That would be through the employee's tax system. You might have had a salary in addition to having some business income. So you've already paid some employee's tax. And if you've got foreign dividends, for example, if you had foreign tax withheld from the foreign dividends, you can get a credit for the foreign tax paid. So any foreign tax paid in the first six months that is eligible for the foreign tax credit under Section 6 Prot, you would deduct that. So what you're left with is your actual provisional tax liability, how much tax you need to pay to SARS for this first provisional tax payment. Okay. And when do you have to pay that tax? Well, the first provisional tax payment is due 
by the end of August, all right? And that's in respect of the tax year ending end of February. So this tax year we're in right now for individuals runs through to the end of February 2018. So six months into the year, 31st of August 2017. You have to make that payment to SARS by that date. The second provisional tax payment um, will has to be made by the last day of the year, and that will cover that second provisional tax payment in a separate uh, Bisbets clip, which we'll put up um, in 2018, closer to the timing of the second provisional payment. So the first provisional payment, your key date is end of August. Okay. Now, what happens if I get it wrong? What happens if, if you don't submit an estimate or you get your estimate wrong? If a taxpayer fails to submit an estimate, SARS may determine an estimate. They can come up with an estimate. They're allowed to do that in terms of the tax legislation. So you fail to submit an estimate, they come up with an estimate probably based on your basic amount and they would require provisional tax be paid based on their estimate. So you, you don't dodge the tax liability just by failing to submit an estimate. Okay. And then the other thing is if you do submit an estimate, SARS can require you to justify your estimate. And this is the point I was making just now. So they, you put, come up with an estimate, they ask you to justify the estimate. And you've got to be able to motivate why your estimate is accurate. And if SARS is not satisfied with your motivation, then they can increase the amount to their estimate, which would usually be at least the basic amount. Okay, in some cases it might be more than the basic amount. All right, just be careful of that. So this does allow, they give you the option to justify your estimate. If they're not satisfied, they can come up with their own estimate, which could be higher than what you estimated. And what does that mean? Well, if they put in their own estimate, then they're going to work out what was the tax payable according to their estimate. And then they're going to require you to, to pay the provisional tax according to that tax liability. Okay. So it might result in you having to pay in more provisional tax than you originally thought. So you need to be very careful about how you estimate your taxable income and be ready to defend if SARS uh, raises a query or asks you to justify your estimate. If you don't pay your first provisional tax liability on time by the end of August 2017, then SARS will charge you a 10% late payment penalty. So let's say that your provisional tax liability was, you, you were supposed to pay in 100,000 Rand, you don't pay on time, the late payment penalty is going to be 10% on that 10,000 Rand. Okay, so that starts getting rather expensive. Bearing in mind, remember, you can't get a tax deduction for the penalties and interest that you pay to SARS. They, are, they would also charge you interest on that outstanding amount. So on, let's say if it was 100,000 that was owing to SARS, they're going to start charging you interest Basically, from the 1st of September, they'll be charging interest, okay? And that also ends up being rather expensive, and you can't get a tax deduction for that expense. Okay, so those are the, the things, the sort of the, the sanctions that will happen. If you don't get your estimate right, uh, SARS can overrule. You end up having to pay according to their estimate. And if you pay late, there's a penalty and interest. So... To recap, we've been through quite a lot of technical things, but the key thing is, first of all, are you a provisional taxpayer? So you need to go through the checklist, am I a provisional taxpayer? Do I fit into the definition of being a provisional taxpayer? If I am a provisional taxpayer, then I went through the obligations. What do I have to do as a provisional taxpayer? I have to estimate my taxable income for the year, calculate my provisional tax liability, and then submit my estimate on the IRP6 form to SARS by the end of August 2017. That's my first provisional uh, return. And then I must also pay whatever provisional taxes owing to SARS by the end of August 2017. Okay, so yeah, I hope that has given you some insight into provisional tax and hopefully it will make your life a little bit easier or maybe more complicated if you realize you are a provisional taxpayer. If you need any assistance or you have any questions on this, please feel free to email us. I will show you the email address on the next slide, which you'll see coming up on your presentation. But from me, Jackie, I'm just going to say at this stage, goodbye. Thank you very much for being with us. And I hope this has been useful. Please send your feedback also to the email address shown in front of you and let us know what other little uh, tax bits you would like um, in terms of these small, understandable, bite-sized pieces of tax information.
Thanks very much. Goodbye.